welcome to this new session we are actually discussing the poems of philip larkin we have already discussed two poems by philip larkin once and um the explosion the third poem that we are going to discuss that is the poem i am going to read with you today is wits and weddings now if you look at the poem you have the text with you i provided that you will see that it is a longer poem it's a long poem in a way it is a poem of eight stanzas and each stanza consisting of 10 lines so obviously it's a an 80 line poem so i am not sure whether i will be able to analyze the whole poem today because if i hurry through i'm sure to leave out or miss certain nuances of the poem now it is a title poem of larkin but this poem was written earlier in fact it was written in in the month of october october 1958 13 years after the end of the second world war and in a way if we want to historicize the poem we will see that late 1950s and the great britain that is the spatio temporal juncture of this particular poem which some readings is a journey poem it is basically a poem about a train journey that the poet took from hull in lincolnshire to london presumably in 1958 when you see the poet himself gives us the hint it was a whitson saturday now whitson what is whitson what is whitson day you know we all know that christ was crucified in circa uh, 30 ad in calvary and uh, according to christians christ came back from the dead there was a resurrection after good friday on which christ was crucified christ was resurrected christ came back on the easter day easter sunday now usually this Easter Sunday falls in the the first week of April. For example, this this year it was April four. Now, according to the chapter on the Acts of Apostle in the Christian New Testament of the Bible. verses 1 to 
we'll see that there is described the Pentecost. You know, this was basically the day on which the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles. Now, obviously, the time of the Whitsun Day and the Whitsun Week falls in late May every year. This year it was May 23, the 23rd day of May. Seven weeks after the Easter Sunday. So obviously, the time of the description, the narrated time, is late May. Now, if you remember your Shakespeare, you will remember that May is the month of summer, the beginning of summer in a country like England. In Europe, in fact, May is the time when summer comes. You remember the darling buds of May in Sonnet 18 of William Shakespeare. It is basically a journey poem, as I have told you. The detached, cynical, observant, Larkin persona. There is this poem. Almost old like. But you know, since we are trying to historicize the poem, even if we are not trying to forget the personal significance of the poem. We have to understand that the time and place described is England of the late 1950s. What kind of a place was it? You are going to London from Hull in Lincolnshire. As a Larkin persona, the speaker actually does. So in a way, the journey he undertakes allows him to look at the scenery. But here, you know, contrary to the convention of journey poems, The element of elation is not that well brought out in this poem. The scenery described is not bucolic or pastoral. Why? Because this was the time when industrialization was hitting England hard and changing the landscape very, very seriously, fundamentally. Now this, if you remember a poem like The Pylons by Spender, you'll see that the denuded landscape, the industrialized landscape, characterized by the ind industrial refuse, the froth. You know, the fish dog, the cooling tower and all that. 
you know there is a very very marked current of urbanization and industrialization that we can actually detect or discern larkin's persona or the larkin persona the speaker of this poem looks at the fleeting landscape from the railway carriage and we are reminded of poems like adult strop or from a railway carriage and so on and so forth so we will see how far we can go today my plan is to read with you the poem in two to three sittings let's see how far we can go shubhashri bonik will read but be very cautious you will read the first stanza but also be ready to stop when i tell you to stop first read the first six lines if you can that wheat sun i was late getting away not till about 120 on the sunlit saturday did my three quarters empty train pull out all windows down all cushions hot all seems of being in a hurry gun wait so he is basically giving you a matter of fact description of the occasion which sun saturday 120 pm that is early afternoon the train is almost entirely empty three quarters empty the carriage is stiflingly hot the windows are down and uh, the, still the cushions are hot so the advent of summer is skillfully virtuously described in terms of a minimalistic painting you know the sense of hurry gone why is it so it it can be described it can be interpreted in two ways one from the temporal temperamental perspective of the speaker the larkin persona he is detached he is cynical so he doesn't feel that he has to be in hurry he has settled down to a journey you know during which he may read he may observe but he is not going to participate in the human drama that there may be on the other hand you know there can be another possible interpretation very practical very matter of fact almost childishly simple you are you are starting a journey a train journey you know this train journey will take a particular amount of time of you from your life whatever you do whether you sing or rave you cannot reach your destination before the train does so there is no point in being in any kind of hurry okay go on till the end of the stanza we ran behind the backs of houses crossed a street of blinding wind screens smelt the fish dog thence 
the river's level drifting breath began where sky and lincolnshire and water meet so in a way again the description is very very matter of fact you are going you are traversing the, uh, a particular landscape the back of houses the fish dock a street full of cars as symbolized by the blinding wind screens so you are going through a landscape the natural part of which is minimal and the artificial part of which is quite substantial okay let's go to the next stanza and vikram you may show the next stanza please and, and and read the first six lines of the next stanza as well all afternoon through the tall heat that that slipped for miles inland a slow and stopping car southwards we kept white forms went by short shadowed kettle and canals with floating of industrial fruit Frost. a hot house okay, okay let's let, let's stop a hot here house. let's stop here with froth you see again the landscape described is not bucolic it's not pastoral it's not a romantic description what does the poet and the others in the train see they are going south towards london by way of a matter of fact description he shows how the personified summer as as symbolized by the heat that is sleeping in a way how it actually sleeps miles inland this personification is very very interesting you remember in the explosion again the slack keep was sleeping in the sun and you know the industrial froth it again shows some kind of a wastage so the dichotomy here is between freshness and wastage that is decay and one of the most important themes of this particular poem is the relentless passing of time time that will decay time that will corrode time that will make fresh things transform them into fresh things into refuse into wastage now this is this is something that we have to understand if we really want to follow the drift of the poem okay go on after froth a hot house flashed uniquely hedges dipped and rose and now and then a smell of grass displaced the reek of buttoned carriage cloth until froth. the next town 
full book? Well, no. Well, here you have to understand that after the short kettle, because he was describing a farm, you had talked about the kettle. Now he has described the hedge. So it's a it's a very very common moving scenery, a landscape. And you see, Larkin shows us whatever he encounters. The olfactory images that he uses here are very interesting. Images to do with the sense of smell, the reek of the button, ca button carriage cloth is displaced by the smell of the grass. But you know, again, grass symbolizes freshness, whereas the carriage cloth, cloth symbolizes staleness. Understood? And it is description of the landscape till the first stoppage. The town. Okay? And you can very easily remember that the train is almost empty. Okay, begin the third stanza and please stop when I tell you to. Second stanza to change one. No, no, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, well, well uh, for first uh, end the second stanza and then go to the third stanza. New and nondescript approach to with acres of dismantled cars. Yes. The scrapyard where dismantled cars are kept. Just as he had seen the blinding windscreens symbolizing new cars in use, he is now describing dismantled cars. The cars that have covered their time of usefulness and have now been consigned to the scrapyard. If the wind, the, the windscreen symbolize cars that were being driven by men, owned by men, the dismantled cars are not owned by owners. They are actually part of the immense wastage that time has wrought. Okay, now let us begin the third stanza and stop when I tell you to. At first, I don't notice what annoys the way. At first, at first, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't notice. notice. Yes, go on. At first, I didn't notice what a noise the weddings made. Each station that we stopped at, sun destroys the interest of what's happening in the shade. And down the long, cool platforms, hoops and skulls, I took four porters lurking with the maids. Stop. And went on reading. Stop, stop, stop. Well, at first, the Larkin persona was indifferent to what was happening. And he actually gives you a very, very cogent explanation of that. Because sometimes the sun actually destroys your sight, your ability to see what is in the shade, shade of the platforms. 
बट द इनेबिलिटी ऑफ लार्किन और द लार्किन पर्सोना टू हियर द नॉइज the din made by the marriage processions or parties it shows a serious detachment and indifference to surroundings because he is describing a station a place from which journeys begin the place at which the goers and the stairs are differentiated some go on and some stay behind we can very easily understand that since he was he is talking about the wedding parties obviously the party has come to the station to see of the somebody let's tell them let's call them somebody at at this point of time they may be the bride and the bridegroom they may also be some honored guest or guests i will come to a more specific classification of the parties seen off later on so larkin thought that actually the porters were making such noise even though the dean was prodigious even though the processions were long and varied consisting of members say mothers fathers uncles friends relatives kids and mature human beings so he was not taking them in so in a way he was bracketing all the noise that they made into an interesting cacophony cacophony and he went on reading for some time okay so in a way the larkin persona is proving himself to be quite detached he has gone till the end of the stanza once we started though we passed them greening and pomaded girls in parodies of fashion heels and veils and po- all posed irresolutely watching us go well when the train started from this particular station for example now larkin could not ignore them all together because he has started the stanza by saying that at first i did not notice them it shows that ultimately eventually he had to notice them and this period of discernment starts from this particular juncture he had to see he could not ignore them what kind of persons fashionable girls parodies of fashion so their tawdriness is very very skillfully foregrounded they are loud they are grinning and pomaded you know pomading means uh, using certain hair product in uh, on your hair so that it it looks shining and all that jewelry substitute are basically imitation jewelry understood so larkins 
anti conventional stance is for everyone to see even the marriage or wedding is considered to be a sacrosanct affair a very sanctified sanctioned by religion and all that as the means of propagating the human race you know larkin is demystifying cliches and myths he is actually presenting the wedding not in a romantic or idealized light but as cheap and tawdry affair and since the wedding party has come to see of some somebody and most of them are left behind <laughs> and they watch the departing guest or bride and bridegroom going away by train to a particular destination get their lives break apart they go their separate ways okay go on as if out on the end of an event waving goodbye to something that survived it struck i linked more promptly out next time more curiously and so it all again in different terms the fathers with broad belts under wait their suits wait 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 so in a way marriages are, are described here not as things to be enjoyed or treated seriously but as things to be survived ordeals to be survived very very irreverent approach to have for a poet and you know ultimately larkin because of the noise because of the curiosity that man has for anything and everything possible almost larkin becomes more and more alert to the changing scenery and because he becomes alert he also understands that even though the scenery is changing even though the stations that his his train is crossing are different even though the wedding party is coming to the station and the survivors getting into the train are different they are at bottom the same at this juncture i should actually pause for some time and tell you that in a way you have to understand that there was a topical reason for so many weddings to take place at this time why is larkin seeing so many wedded wedding wedding processions you know in post war britain the prevalent tax laws and employment laws also made this time the whitsun week the whitsun weekend the most propitious for weddings because you know there were the, the um, there were the uh bank holidays so obviously uh, it is uh, a bit longer as we can because you know the bank holidays fell uh, on the 
Monday. So three days, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, these were the holidays. And there were tax rebates. Because of the ceremonial nature of weddings, you had to entertain people, guests, and there are certain tax rebates for such entertainments held in hotels, banquet halls, cheap inns, and all that. Because the kind of wedding parties that Larkin is describing are from the lower middle strata of the society. As you can very easily understand, because you know, they are not going places by car. They are taking the public transport. And the cheap um, uh, jewelry sub substitutes are also indicative of the tawdriness and cheapness of the weddings. The wedding ceremony, at least. And I will ultimately show you how this apparently cynical and indifferent speaker will ultimately become sensitive to the grandeur of the occasion and the meaning of the ceremony. Okay, go on. The fathers, the fathers with broad belts under their suits and semi foreheads, mothers loud and fat, and uncle shouting smart, and then the palms, the nylon gloves, and jewelry substitutes, the lemons, mops, and olive orchards that. Okay. So he is actually describing the wedding parties, the, 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 the processions, you know. There are fathers who are satisfied that they have been able to marry off their daughters. But they are also aware of a kind of a farcical, a comical nature of the whole affair. And there are mothers who are loud and fat, you know, and, 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 and uncles who are rude and obscene. The colors of dresses are also pointed out. Lemon, mauve, and so on and so forth. Ochre, not ocha. Okay. So, in a way, to the detached, disinterested onlookers, that the Larkin persona is, the scene appears to be almost the same, even though the parties change. The individuals change, but the character of the winning parties remain almost the same. Okay, go on. marked off the girls unreally from the rest. Yes, from cafes and banquet halls up years, and bunting dressed, coach party annexes, the wedding days were coming to an end. All down the line, fresh couples climbed abroad. The rest abroad. stood round. Well, uh the rest stood round. Let, let, let's uh, end the stanza. The last conf confetti and advice were thrown. And as we moved, each face seemed to define. 
just what it saw departing children frowned and something dull fathers had never known okay so in a way they have come to see off the brides and bridegrooms as has been pointed out here the wedding is over and the bride and the bridegroom has to begin a new journey and here the train journey is symbolic of their life's journey as well conjugal life married life you know each sees what it understands as departing each of them you know these wedding parties come to the railway station or depot from the venues at which the weddings took place and the receptions took place weddings must Um, may have taken place in churches and chapels, but you know, the reception is over, and the weddings are also coming to an end because you know the Whitsun week was supposed to be a very very. convenient time for choosing to be wed uh can you repeat this stanza this is the fourth stanza yes sir fifth yes yes the sorry the fifth stanza can you can you repeat it marked of the girls and really from the rest yes from cafes and banquet halls up yards and bunting dressed coach party coach party annexes the wedding days were coming to an end all down the line fresh couples climbed aboard the rest stood round the last confetti and advice were thrown and as we moved each phase seemed to define just what it saw departing children frowned at something dull fathers had never known okay so you you see what class of people and what age groups are pointed out there are girls who are differentiated from the others of the party by their dresses and by their pose children are bored by this side because they do not understand the real meaning of marriage and fathers are also pointed out because they are supposed to be spending for the ceremony they are the sponsors of the, these ceremonies you know the new couples the newly wed couples get into the train they embark and ultimately each of the onlookers seems to define what he or she saw departing because you know this is very very significant this line the confetti is thrown and the advices are also last parting advice to the bride and the bridegroom maybe 
that is actually thrown to them or thrown at them. But you know, ultimately, you have to understand that each pa each individual of this wedding party must have his or her own perspective. Must be related to the whole, associated with the whole in their own different ways. So what each saw departing must be different. For the fathers, the departing couple meant number one, a responsibility discharged, but also affection and anxiety for the well-being of their daughters. For children, no such clear-cut attachment was this. For girls, they are fascinated and flamoused at the same time. They may think about their own marriages that may or may not have taken place with fascination, with joy, or with regret. So in a way, everybody has the chance to identify themselves with the departing couples or to be different from them. So the response of each to this moving panorama has to be different. So today, what I have done is to give you some idea of the first five stanzas of the poem, Written Weddings. I have given you the occasion of the poem and the basic drift of the argument. If you have any queries, you may ask them. Are there any questions? Okay. If there are no questions, then I will tell Shamim Siddiq to remove me from the class. Please do remember, tomorrow's class will open at 9 a.m. And I will continue with this poem. Okay, sir.